talk about today is a lot of the work I've been doing here over the past couple of years looking at uh, mobile devices and how users make decisions regarding sharing personal information with apps and how we can improve that uh, the experience. Um, but before I get into that, stepping back for a second, I wanted to just give a little high level of most of the stuff, the type of problems that I work on. Um, within usable security, there are sort of two big problems that we see with a lot of systems. So, one, we see a lot of unnecessary user interactions, such as you know, warning messages, and these habituate users, because they see these so often, um, you get I guess, sort of the, the crying wolf effect, where people eventually ignore these, and that um, decreases their um, efficacy. Um, the other problem related to this is that users are often asked to make a lot of decisions that they're simply unqualified to make. Um, really good example in the uh, security domain, uh, SSL errors. So how many users are, it's, you know, how, how many users should know what a certificate authority is or a revocation list, um, yet many people in industry, you know, sort of expect that everyone should be familiar with these terms, um, what they mean when something doesn't go correctly, and then what they should be doing about it. And I think in practice we know that's complete garbage, um, instead, by focusing on the questions that users are actually qualified to make and not bothering them unless we absolutely need to bother them, security outcomes can greatly be improved. And we can see, we can take a lot of this from the classic literature on hazard avoidance. So, in the, you know, the best case, if, if the system can detect some sort of hazard, um, what we should be doing is eliminating it so that there's no chance of failure, users aren't exposed to risks. Obviously, in every case, you can't do that, so the next best thing you can do is maybe guard against the hazard um, to decrease the likelihood of the risk. Um, and then, the last thing you should do, if none of this applies, is warn. Um, and too often, what we see is, in computer science, we just sort of skip this last step by throw up warnings and expect the user to just deal with it. And that's sort of the cause of a lot of the security and privacy problems that we see today. So, moving forward, uh, mobile privacy and security, why is this interesting? Well, we're at a sort of a state right now in computing that most people have smartphones. They're you know, the main platform that a lot of people use. And smartphone adoption is only going to increase. 50% um, of the, the phones in the US are smartphones and that they can run third-party apps. Um, and, you know, previously with desktop computing, um, there are a lot of people who own desktop computers who really only needed it for a few things, such as maybe checking email or browsing the web, um, and therefore it wasn't really, you know, a lot of people didn't find the desktop opposition attractive, um, and that's why smartphones have sort of uh, filled that niche, because people can use them for very limited tasks, um, ta the only the tasks that they want to use them for, and very inexpensive. But we have a lot of privacy and security threats, similar to the ones that we have on desktop com you know, computing platforms, in that, you know, because you can execute third-party apps on them. So there are, really, there are two different types of threats. Um, there's malware, which I'm not really going to talk about in this talk so much, um, because I, I would argue, um, feel free to argue with me, that this problem is largely solved on the mobile space. Um, and by malware, I mean unwanted apps um, that cause damage, such as you know vulnerabilities being exploited, worms, viruses, stuff like that. Um, the reason why this is largely solved on the mobile space, it, it certainly exists, but um, it's less of a problem than in the desktop space because most of the platforms are centrally controlled. So if you have an Android phone and you have a you know, contract, when these things are identified, they're identified relatively quickly, and the provider or Google can remotely pull the, the offending code off your device. And so the spread is much more limited than what we have in the desktop. And that brings up the second big problem, though, with security and privacy, which is much more prevalent, and that's grayware. And by grayware, I mean apps that users find desirable, that they installed on their devices knowingly, but also might be using data in ways that, they un that are unexpected and they potentially object to. And so the issue is, how do you make these data usages uh, more obvious to end users? Um, and then if you make them more obvious, will users make the same decisions about what they install on their devices? And currently, this is a really hard problem with all of the major smartphone platforms. So, so to give an example, um, 
say a user notices that they have an excessive SMS charge um, on their phone bill. They get this at the end of the month, and this was completely unexpected. So they assume it was some, some app that caused this. How do they determine what app was responsible so that they can then go and uninstall the app uh, so they don't get charges in the future? Well, in Android, uh, by the way, in uh, iOS, there is no way of, easy way of determining this. In Android, user goes to the main menu, they click the, the thing to pull up the list of apps, they get a list of apps, they now scroll through to the settings thing, find that, open it, brings up a list of settings, they have to know to scroll down to applications, select that, go to manage applications, and it brings up a list of all the applications that are installed on their device. So now they have to go through sequentially and select each one of these apps. Brings up a new uh, settings thing about the data for that app. They have to know to scroll down to the bottom. And only then does it show the permissions that that app has. Um, and they would be looking for, say, the ability to send uh, SMS messages. Even after this 12-step process, um, that only tells them which apps have the capability. It doesn't necessarily say what app is responsible. So obviously, there must be better ways of attributing, attributing misbehaviors um, to particular applications. So in this talk, I was going to talk. I was going to go into more detail about problems with the permission systems on mobile platforms, um, and also about how one of the big difficulties in the area is choosing the right mechanism for granting permissions and how. Um, poor decisions in that area creates a lot of usability problems that we see. Uh, and then finally I was going to talk about how in some cases simply asking for permission might be misguided and instead we should be retroactively creating uh, audit mechanisms so the users can see what happened uh, in the past. And then there's some future work. So current problems Uh, about a year and a half ago, we did a survey of current Android users to see how well they understood the permission granting interface within Android. Uh, we surveyed a little over 300 of them. We debated this all online, but the way that we uh, ensured that they were actually Android users is we commissioned a ad, ad mob ad, so everyone who saw the ad we knew was using an Android device. And it brought up a list of these permission questions. So uh, it showed a screenshot of a given permission on the Android platform and asked users in a multiple choice format what they believe the app could do if this permission was granted. And so this was multiple choice. For each one, we had four different responses. For instance, in this case, it's granted full internet access is the permission. Uh, the options are read your phone contacts, load advertisements, read text messages, or send information to an application server. None of these, and I don't know. Um, so the correct answer in this case would be, you know, this could be used to load advertisements as well as send information to an application server. Every participant saw three of these permission requests. And what we found was of the three, on average, they got 0.6 questions correct. Um, we can you know, create a function to look at the expected value here from the random guessing, and you know, we would expect to see you know, about a third of this rate. But you know, So while this is significantly greater than what we'd expect from random guessing, which indicates that people actually tried to answer correctly, this is still pretty poor comprehension. So for instance, only eight people uh, were able to correctly uh, respond to all three of the questions here out of 300. Uh, over 50% couldn't get any of them correct. So <clears throat> the question is, why are the rates so low? And this is where uh, qualitative research is, is important. We recruited 24 people um, who used Android, who used Craigslist, and we had them come in uh, to do interviews about how they use their device. We had a couple tasks as well. So first we had them install two different applications. We asked them to just go to the Android market and pick applications that would fulfill this scenario. We gave them a couple different scenarios. And the goal of these scenarios was to see, during the installation process, on their own personal devices, do they pay any attention to these permission uh, messages which are shown in install time. And then we had a third task, where we asked them to pull up a list of applications installed on their devices, and pick one that they use very frequently, and just answer yes or no, does this application have the ability to send text messages? Um, we even had them open up the settings application, which I showed you earlier, which listed the actual permissions. 
And so what we found was during the installations, uh, only about 17% of our permissions, uh, or participants viewed the permissions. Um, this is also likely an upper bound, so you know, if they were in the laboratory, they knew that something was being studied, it's possible they paid you know, more diligence to the task than they would if they had been installing it otherwise. When we asked them uh, if the app would send SMS messages, while they were looking at the list of permissions that the app had been granted, 64% uh, of them were incorrect. And so from this preliminary study, uh, we came up with a bunch of recommendations for how these permissions could be improved. So the most common case was that many people were simply habituated. They said that they see these requests all the time. They occur every time they install an app. Therefore, you know, they just learn not to pay attention to them because of the frequency with which they see them. And so the recommendation here is maybe in certain cases we should only prompt when necessary. For instance, if there's a you know, high risk of something being abused, in many cases, uh, permissions are relatively benign. So for instance, maybe change, you know, there's a permission for changing the wallpaper of the device. Um, that could you know, potentially be benign. Changing the time, requesting internet access, given that over 90% of applications in the market request internet access, users probably shouldn't see that every time since it's probably assumed that apps are requesting internet access. Uh, another problem was people were simply unaware. So during the installation process, um, for those who aren't familiar, when you choose an app from the market, you click install, and it's only after you click install that it brings up this page of permissions that the app is going to be granted. Many thought that that was uh, the equivalent of a EULA, a license agreement, that they were sort of trained to just click through. Um, there are other possible cognitive biases, so for instance, choice supportive bias. Um, at that point, they'd already made a decision to install an app, that, that particular app. Um, by showing them the permissions, they probably don't want to revisit the decision that they had already made. So maybe changing where in the installation process these, these appear would improve uh, how much users pay attention to them. And finally, the problem that we saw with the SMS granting um, was that most users didn't understand that, this, that there's a specific permission for sending SMS messages. Um, many saw the request for internet access and figured, well, this you know, SMS could use the network, therefore maybe it's a part of this. So the problem with this is that knowing whether an app has a specific ability requires an understanding of the whole spectrum of abilities that it could be requesting. In the case of Android, there are over 100 different permissions. It's not really reasonable that every end user be familiar with every possible permission that an app can request. So from these recommendations, we decided to start looking at permission systems uh, more generally. So stepping back for a second, um, this study looked at installation uh, permissions, but there are many other different ways of requesting uh, permission for various abilities. And this applies to more than just smartphones, for instance, you know, web apps or desktop platforms as well. So looking at the install time warnings that I just talked about, these are advantageous because they're adaptable to many different permissions. You just need some screen real estate to list what the thing is requesting. Um, but the problem is that, you know, there's limited screen real estate. So in the case of your mobile device, it'll only show three, you know, three here by default, and the user has to know to scroll down to see all of them. It also lacks context, so it says that you know, it wants to record audio, but if you're doing this at installation time, you have no idea under what circumstances it's going to record audio or why. Uh, they're also, as I mentioned, because of the way they are at the end of the process, very easy to overlook. And that gives way to runtime warnings, which sort of build on this, but they have the advantage of adding contextual information. So the user is actually trying to do something when they're asked for permission. So, you know, for instance, if you click, you know, find something near me, and then it asks for you know, permission to access the GPS on your device, it's, it's pretty obvious why the GPS is being accessed. That's not to say that it won't be used for secondary uses, but the user has a better understanding of how the data might be used. Also, when this, hap when this happens at runtime, you can also add con other contextual information to make these you know, permission requests a lot more dynamic. So for instance, maybe you know, granting permission to pair with a device, you can dynamically list the name of the device um, and other security information there, which you can't do at, run uh, or at in install time when you're granting a future. But like the install time warnings, 
these also have many drawbacks. So one is habituation. Um, everyone who has used Windows is probably familiar with this. This became sort of the, the bane of uh, Windows Vista. Uh, anytime an application required administrative level privileges, even when the user was logged in as administrator, you get this uh, UAC dialogue, user account control. And they were you know, pretty well mocked in the press for the frequency with which users would be bombarded with these requests. And so this quickly habituates users. Users also see these as a barrier to complete the primary task. So, you know, you were trying to do something when this box came up and it's preventing you from doing what you were trying to do. And so since it's a barrier, you know, they just want to click through it quickly to dismiss it to get on with doing what they were trying to do. 